This is an exclusive. We are in conversation with the UK Secretary of State for Trade and Business as also Minister for Women and Equalities, Kemi Bednok. Many thanks for joining us here on the India Today Network. Thank you. Let's begin with your uh, meetings uh, at the G20. Trade meetings, how do you see G20's presidencies? The challenges for India this time are many, particularly to do with bringing about consensus in a polarized world. Uh, you hit on, uh, on the main issue. I think India has actually had quite a successful uh, G20 presidency. Certainly, if we look at what happened uh, during the trade ministerial conference, it has been a very difficult time in the world. Post the pandemic, there's a war in uh, you know, Russia's war in Ukraine. We're looking at supply chain issues. And actually, trade is one of the areas that can really help deliver uh, solutions for many of the problems that we see today. Trade is what uh, creates global prosperity, making sure that nations are working well together uh, and coming up with the solutions, not just for today, but also for, for the future. So we covered multiple topics from how to tackle climate change to digitalizing trade, making it easier for the very smallest of businesses um, to be able to access many of those market opportunities which that tend to pass them by and just go to go to the big players. So I think we had a, we had a good conference and everybody was particularly um, uh, bowled over by so much of the history and the culture of India, which Minister Goyal integrated into the G20 conference. So, well, so it was very successful. Um, that has been the idea uh, 200 meetings, 50 cities, mm. trying to get in a lot of Indian culture this time around. But when there are visits such as this one, there's also a bilateral aspect. Yes. Let's dive into that. Yes. Alive with Opportunity campaign. Uh, elaborate for our viewers what that really means for India UK trade ties. How will that really double trade between the two countries? So one of the things that I try and tell people is that uh, a free trade agreement is not the end, it's the beginning of trade. You're effectively setting the rules and the parameters, you're building the road. But in order to get the cars going, that's the, uh, you know, the exports, the investment, you need to do a lot more work. And Alive with Opportunity is how we have branded that work that we're going to do, which is, uh, for instance, bringing in more trade missions so that they can see what opportunities there are in this country and also in the UK, this is a two-way, it's a two-way thing. It's not all about um, what the UK is doing in India. It's also about what India can do in, in the UK. And what we find is that many people don't even know what is happening. They have businesses, but they don't think about exporting because both the UK and the India markets are so large. But people don't know that there is uh, business to be done elsewhere. So Alive with Opportunity is about us sharing that knowledge and making sure that we make the most of trade. You mentioned the free trade agreement, so I'll have to ask you, how's the process on the negotiations that are underway when it comes to the FTA? We know that there are problems uh, with regards to scotch imports as also automobile sector. Where is that headed? So I wouldn't say that there are problems uh, anywhere, actually. The negotiations have been going well, but as with any kind of negotiation, you often finish the bits that are uh, easiest. So we've closed most of the chapters and it's the toughest bits that are always the last ones, uh, the last ones to deal with. And that's why having the bilateral meetings, you're taking the opportunity of G20 to meet the ministers here and iron out the issues is really critical. I am confident that we're going to have a very successful deal that works well for both the UK and India. But what I'm not doing is giving a date. I was going to yes. ask you that. <laughs> Everybody wants to know the date. I have never set a date. Um, some people talked about previous dates or this year, Diwali, next year, and also you know, Christmas and so on. I don't think that that is helpful during negotiations because it can make people change their decision-making process. We want people to focus on, is this a good, uh, is this a good proposal? Does it work for the people of India? Does it work for the people of the UK? Will it deliver benefits? Is it what business is asking for? And if not, how can we find a solution or a workaround? And that's really what we're doing right now. That's an important aspect, but also working with an administration. We know foreign policy, even trade policies are a continuum, mm -hmm. but there could be a difference if the administration is different. Within the Modi administration, they're looking at elections next mm -hmm. year. Are you hopeful it would happen before the elections next year, even if you don't give me a time frame? No, it's, 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 a very, it's a very good question because we also uh, will be having elections yes. too. No government is there forever. Certainly no democratic government is there 
forever. And that is why having the stability of the current UK uh, government and the current uh, Indian government, we've been having these conversations for a long time now. We know where we are. I think making sure that we can conclude uh, in advance of elections will be helpful. If we don't, that will quite likely make things take even longer. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I can't set a date. But certainly, if we don't finish before elections, it will prolong, it will prolong the process. So you are hopeful, are you looking at uh, before elections for that, both the countries? That would be ideal, ideal, but again, it all depends on where we get to with the negotiations. You also are, as a country, looking at a lot of investments into the UK. Mm -hmm. How does that really gel with India's Make in India uh, plans and mm -hmm. program? Uh, we are looking at Tata now investing furthermore in the United Kingdom mm -hmm. and a lot of investors that you look at, you, Tata is certainly an example, but how do you then converge the idea of investments into the UK as opposed to Make in India where investments and in manufacturing India would like invited to India? Okay, so it is a two-way street and we believe in free trade. So it is not a zero-sum game. If somebody is investing in the UK, it doesn't mean that they've taken something away from India because if you follow that argument to the logical conclusion, then there will be no trade um, at all. Trade benefits both parties. No one creates an exchange that's going to lose them. When you go to the market and you buy something, they haven't stolen your money, they've given you mm. something, else, um, something else in return. And what I would say is that our economies are quite different. Uh, India has a large manufacturing base, a lot of its economy is based around goods exports. We are a services economy, so it's actually symbiotic. About 70% of UK exports um, are services, and this is something where there is knowledge exchange, there's a lot of educational uh, programs, research and development that's happening. It doesn't all just happen in one country. If you look at, for instance, vaccine development, th these things happen with, with collaboration. So it is possible to have a made in India or a make in India strategy while still investing in the UK because there is benefit to both sides. So you do speak about free trade. What's your idea of free trade, not just for two countries when we talk about bilateral agreements, but globally? Because there are economies that are smaller who think their businesses, small businesses mm -hmm. can be impacted. What do you have to say to them when they are looking at or when the world is looking at free trade mm -hmm. but not really looking into why certain economies are not very open to free trade? Yes. So this is why we often don't speak of free trade in isolation. We talk about free and fair trade. And as I said, uh, we discussed during that ministerial conference um, of the G20 that we're looking at ways to help the very small players, you know, the MSMEs, the micro the micro businesses even. Uh, digital trade is one area that would uh, really benefit them. But where those sorts of things are necessarily possible, in the UK, we have things like the developing countries trading scheme. We, we know that it's not, a, it's not necessarily a level playing field. But free and fair trade really comes from having rules that everybody is following. So yes, it can be about reducing barriers, but often it's about making sure that people are playing by the same rules. No, uh, you know, bringing in anti-dumping uh, measures to make sure that other markets that might be fragile are not flooded and other things where it's, uh, you know, certain countries might be doing things that are not enhancing for the countries that are receiving the goods. We need to make sure that there's a rules-based system and a level playing field. And that's where the free and fair trade idea comes from. Shifting focus uh, on, a, on a matter important, but a little different. Mm. Now, India has launched its successful Chandrayaan lunar mission. Yes. But when it comes to the UK, there has been a bit of a controversy and a debate over the lunar mission, uh, where a certain section, and I might, uh, might I add that it's a very small number mm. of people, have raised objections to UK aid to India, mm -hmm. saying if a country can have a space program, why do they need aid? Explain to our viewers, not just here, but mm -hmm. also to those who are questioning this in the UK, yeah. what that aid really entails. 2.3 billion pounds that they're talking about come in terms of now are translated into investments where mm -hmm. the UK is getting returns and jobs. So India no longer, since 2012, has no longer required aid. Uh, what is this controversy? If you could put it to rest and let them know what I this aid 
now investment really means? Well, you've, you've actually answered the, you've <laughs> answered the question a bit um, uh, yourself. What happens is that many people don't know mm. what is going on. They don't know what has changed from the 1980s or the 1990s. And there's this big assumption that there's a lot of money that is being sent uh, that's just, you know, they, they think of it as charity, whereas we know that we are investing in areas of international uh, collaboration, things like climate research and so on. These are things that need to be funded uh, from a global perspective, and those are the sorts of things that, that the, the UK is doing. But actually, what I really wanted to emphasize is that the UK is really excited about uh, the moon landing. It was all we talked about at G20, so not just us, but many of the other countries, because quite often space programs are looked at as a luxury or something that's away from the bread and butter of, um, of domestic polit uh, politics. But actually, these things do co contribute to the enhancement of mankind. They contribute to innovation, and they show people that there is so much more beyond whatever is in uh, it, within your immediate world. And that's what I would say to the people who make those comments, that they need to open their eyes and open their mind and see what exactly um, is going on in the world. Also, the budget that India had was rather small. Mm. They really, it is, an, it is a huge achievement in a, within, within a very small budget. Mm. Having said that, there is clarity that the aid that comes is investment mm. with UK getting returns and jobs. Well, yes, it's investments. Some investments will pay off, some won't. But the reason why we're doing it is because India is not, you know, a supplicant country. It is a country that has its own, you know, story to tell the world. It's the world's sixth largest economy. And so the kind of relationship that one has from an aid perspective is evolving. And that's, that's really what we need to make sure people understand. Inclusivity within the G20, within the UK, within India. How do you look at that? Because you're also Minister of Women and Equalities, mm -hmm. inclusivity in not just the economic programs, but also policy decisions. How do you look at that? Uh, we look at it across the board because we know that if we don't make those decisions at uh, international level, sometimes it's very difficult to encourage other countries to make uh, policy choices that they find difficult whether for cultural or financial reasons. So you will often find us um, at these meetings talking about what we can do on women's empowerment, what we can do on the environment, which is a huge uh, inclusivity issue because many of the people most impacted are uh, the world's poorest. We look at labor and uh, you know, workers' rights. These are all issues that are discussed at pretty much every G20 uh, uh, conference, let alone the other four, uh, such as the WTO and, and so on. And I think that we will continue to do so. On that note, Minister Badenoch, many thanks for joining us here. Thank in you. India today. Indeed a pleasure. Thank you.